Have you ever sat and stared up at the stars and wondered, where did we come from? Let's take a journey like no other, not to a place, but to a time. Join us as we delve deep into the human past and explore our shared human origins. Welcome to the world of paleoanthropology. Hello, everybody. This is Seth from the world of paleoanthropology. Today, we have a very exciting event going on that we've been planning for the last few months. And that, of course, would be our symposium on bipedalism, which is upright walking. We have quite a few special guests, some who are presenting and some who will be discussing what is being presented. And at the end, we will have a question and answer for questions that were submitted prior to our recording. This is going to be an awesome event. We're going to have a lot of people talking about this great topic that I'm sure many of you are interested in. And I would like to start off with Professor Jeremy De Silva. And he is a professor at Dartmouth College with a PhD from the University of Michigan. He's the author of the 2001 book, First Steps, How Upright Walking Made Us Human. And he is, of course, interested in the origins of the, and the evolution of bipedalism. And he works in the field in South Africa at Leitoli, Tanzania. Jeremy, why don't I hand it off to you? Um, so yeah, yeah, what I was saying, I'm really passionate about origins and evolution of upright walking, as Seth said. Uh, if, I, if I exceed my 20 minutes, someone's going to have to pull me off the stage here. <laughs> Just let me know if I go too far. But one of the things, is, um, as I was thinking about what I wanted to say, uh, is that as we talk about the origins of upright walking, um, there's so much we don't know. There's so much that we don't understand about, about when bipedalism evolved, from what did we evolve bipedalism, the body form from which we evolved bipedalism, when this happened, why this happened. And so as a scientist, it's really exciting to not have answers to things, because those are the things that we can then investigate as scientists. Um, and, uh, and this is one of those really, really wonderful topics where there's a lot we know, and certainly more we, we know now than we, we, we ever have before, but there's a ton we still don't know. And so interspersed throughout here is going to be a lot of uncertainty, a lot of stuff that we don't know. Now, certainly we know that bipedalism moving on two legs defines uh, uh, the, the hominin lineage. Uh, moving on two legs is, is quite unique to us amongst, amongst primates. And it's so human-like that when we want to uh, create human-like characters uh, in our culture, we make them walk on two legs, right? Whether it's Brian from Family Guy or Mickey Mouse or SpongeBob or Winnie the Pooh. Moving on two legs is deeply, deeply rooted in our ancestry. We have fossilized evidence of footprints at Laetoli, which uh, Ellie is going to talk about. Uh, Professor McNutt will, will speak about these footprints. Uh, and then, of course, we've left footprints on, on the moon. Um, now, moving on two legs is, is strange for a, a mammal. We have mammals out there that, that fly and swim, uh, mammals that sprint and knuckle walk, leap and swing. Most mammals just move around like this cow does, which is on all fours, a quadrupedal animal. And so habitually moving on two legs, again, is, is very strange for, uh, for, for a mammal. Um, but it's not entirely unusual for an animal to move on two legs, right? Lizards can do it. Certainly the bipedal uh, uh, terrestrial birds move on two legs. Their dinosaur ancestors moved on two legs. There's this great video here of an uh, of a, a octopus moving on, on two legs. Mammals can stand up on, on two legs, right? Uh, Jernook feeding in a, a bipedal posture. Uh, prairie dogs will get up on two legs to sort of scan the horizon. Uh, threat displays sometimes like this cat is doing. Uh, again, that's a postural thing. But again, bipedalism can happen in a locomotor context as well. And so bears are one of the more bipedal of the mammals. This is a bear from uh, suburban New Jersey named Petals, who would, uh, was filmed uh, walking around uh, folks' backyard um, uh, up through 2015. But the group of animals that moves on two legs most frequently are, of course, the primates. So this is a great video from uh, Susanna Carvalho's work of chimpanzees raiding a papaya farm and filling up their hands with, with uh, papayas and mangoes and then moving on two legs. So bipedalism is something that we do see in other mammals, particularly in other primates, even though humans are the, one, the only ones that do it all the time, right? So during uh, COVID, uh, this is a paper that we just had come out 
last month during COVID, a student uh, contacted of mine has contacted a number of, of zoos and asked how often their apes and their monkeys move on two legs. And we got lots and lots of responses. In fact, 500 responses. And what we found is that uh, amongst the primates and zoos, about 40 to 50 percent of the gorillas, chimpanzees, orangutans, bonobos will walk on, on two legs. Um, it's highest, though, amongst the gibbons and the siamongs, uh, upwards of, of almost 90% of them will walk on two legs, and they'll do it for, for many, many, many steps. And so moving on two legs is part of the locomotor repertoire of primates and of our ape cousins. And so what's my point? My point is that bipedalism, moving on two legs, was not a novel locomotion. It didn't pop out of nowhere. Instead, its evolution had to have involved a shift from occasionally doing it, like we see in all of our ape cousins, to only doing this. And the million dollar question, the question we don't have the answer for right now, is why? Um, now, when I talk about why did bipedalism evolve with my students, oftentimes I start with um, the negative parts of it. We often don't consider that moving on two legs has all of these costs. And one of the costs is speed. The fastest human on earth, Usain Bolt, the fastest he ever ran was still half the speed of a galloping zebra, antelope, lion, or leopard. This would have made, so moving on two legs makes us slow. And this would have made our ancestors vulnerable to predation. And sure enough, we see in the fossil record, littered throughout the fossil record, evidence that we were eaten, that our ancestors were, were eaten by hyenas and large cats and, 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 and crocodiles. And so we weren't the hunters early in our evolutionary history, we were the hunted. So moving on two legs made us somewhat vulnerable. It also makes us vulnerable to injury. We, we, we fall, um, and, and this is sort of presented comically here, um, but this can be quite serious and, and folks can, can get injured doing this and uh, there are even fatalities uh, related to uh, uh, falling uh, from a bipedal posture. We have sore backs and collapsed arches and we sprain our ankles and we tear our ACLs. We have all sorts of problems associated with moving on two legs. And yet what was pointed out to me by uh, our, our good colleague, Will Harcourt Smith at the American Museum of Natural History a few years ago, he said to me when I was talking about all these disadvantages, he said, yes, but the advantages had to have outweighed the costs. Otherwise we wouldn't be here. And he's absolutely spot on. So what are these advantages? Well, we've, we've, we, we look at the circumstances of bipedalism and other apes to try to figure this out. And we also, of course, think about how bipedalism provides advantages to us today. We can carry things by, by freeing up the upper limbs from the duties and the responsibilities of locomotion. We can now use our hands and our arms to carry things, carry food, for instance. Some have argued that this is important for provisioning others, and this might have been instrumental in the origins and evolution of bipedalism, carrying babies. Others have argued, and this is a, a long-held idea, which I think has been thoroughly refuted, but a long-held idea that this is about carrying weapons and that early hominins were violent uh, and aggressive. Others have taken this to uh, a slightly uh, different level and argued that uh, the bipedal locomotion that we see in some other apes is about display, right? Maybe not violence, but some form of, of aggressive display that you sometimes see, particularly male chimpanzees. Uh, for others, this is about seeing over tall grass. This goes back to Lamarck, even pre-Darwinian ideas of the origins of bipedalism, what we call the peekaboo hypothesis. This is Russ Tuttle's um, comical sort of I I idea around the seeing over the tall grass idea, I called it the peekaboo hypothesis. Uh, Kevin Hunt has argued that this is a feeding adaptation, that we evolved our bipedal posture so that we could uh, pick low-hanging fruit as chimpanzees sometimes do. Uh, things get a, a, a little out of control. Uh, in the 1970s, there was an idea known as the, what is being, again, comically called the trench coat hypothesis, that this is about a, it, it displaying external genitalia and that that's why bipedalism evolved. Uh, this is where we start to enter into a world where this, these are non-scientific ideas anymore. How do you test the hypothesis? What fossils would you need to see to test the idea and refute the idea that the trench coat hypothesis is why bipedalism evolved. This is non-testable as far as I can think of it and understand it and therefore non-scientific. Um, the aquatic ape idea has a great marketing campaign behind it. A lot of folks have embraced this idea, but I don't think it aligns with the evidence at all in our uh, early uh, uh, hominin 
uh, ancestors, but ecology probably did play an important role in the adoption of bipedal locomotion. There's evidence that there were changing environments uh, in the late Miocene as bipedalism was probably uh, taking hold in our hominin ancestors. And so some have argued that this was inefficient means to get from point A to point B across an open grassland environment to get from food patch to food patch. Why would that be beneficial though in this changing environment? Some have argued this has to do with thermal regulation and cooling the body, moving on two legs rather than exposing the whole body to solar radiation on all fours. Others have hypothesized that this is about energetics and that moving on two legs is a particularly energetically efficient form of moving uh, uh, from, from point A to point B. We're slow, but uh, we don't use much energy getting from, from point A to point B. So maybe that's why this was advantageous to our uh, ancestors. The truth is though, and I've been studying bipedalism for 20 years, 15, 20 years now, the truth is we don't know. We honestly don't know why bipedalism evolved. And the folks that argue vehemently for one hypothesis or, or another, um, uh, well, I, 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 I just don't buy it. I don't think we have the evidence yet to know exactly why bipedalism evolved. And it could be um, that we're thinking of this the wrong way. Why, why we're searching for a singular reason why bipedalism was advantageous uh, might be problematic. Um, I think Tanner and Zillman in the 1970s presented us with a nice model of thinking of this as multifactorial, that there might've been multiple reasons why bipedalism could have been uh, advantageous to our early hominin uh, ancestors. But one of the things to notice is that in all of these models for why bipedalism evolved, the animal that is often portrayed or even tested to try to figure out whether there is support for a hypothesis or whether there isn't uh, is often the chimpanzee. Uh, or, the, or, the, or the bonobo, with the assumption being that the common ancestor from which bipedalism uh, arose was a knuckle-walking African ape-like animal, like a gorilla or a chimpanzee. And this is the kind of imagery, of course, that you see on coffee cups and t-shirts and bumper stickers. And, and this, this idea known as the march of progress has become ingrained in our culture. So when we Google human evolution or talk to folks uh, about human evolution, this is the kind of imagery that they're thinking of. And yet, as we learn more and more and more about these early uh, 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 ancestors of ours and about the apes from which they evolved, we're not finding evidence of knuckle walking uh, in the fossil record at that time period. It doesn't mean they weren't, but we just don't have evidence of it yet. And so others have proposed different kinds of models from the body form from which bipedalism evolved. Uh, 15 years ago now, uh, Thorpe and Crompton proposed that it was more of an orangutan-like body using hand-assisted bipedalism in the trees. And so it's sort of a, a, a top-down approach to bipedalism rather than a bottom-up, or instead of a knuckle walker rising up, it's something that's bipedal in the trees coming down as the environment's changing throughout the late Miocene and early Pliocene. Uh, another version of this is what's known as the hylobatid model. Again, as I mentioned earlier, gibbons and siamongs are very bipedal. And so it could be that that's the kind of body form from which bipedalism may have evolved. Not necessarily something with those crazy long arms, but something with a comparable body type, a longer lower back and a wider torso. Owen Lovejoy, Tim White, and colleagues have argued that the body form from which bipedalism evolved was something more what we call pronograde, moving on all fours, more like a monkey or a tailless monkey. And the thing is, we do find fossils of things like that early in the Miocene, what we call proconsoles. These are 18, 19, 20 million years old. And that might be the body form from which these different forms of locomotion evolved. And again, back to the idea of what we don't know we don't know the body form from which bipedalism evolved. We all have sort of our, our pet hypotheses, but we're still trying to figure this out. And in fact, a paper that came out last year by Ashley Hammond, one of the, the contributors to today's symposium, uh, and her colleagues argued that, um, that modern apes may not be a good model for understanding the body form from which these different locomotor modes, including bipedalism sprung. And that the fossil record from the Miocene, this fascinating time period uh, where we have fossil apes 
throughout Southern Europe and into Asia and in Africa, that these body forms are actually different from anything that lives today. And it could be that the body form from which all of these different locomotive modes was not like anything living today. Um, a colleague of ours and someone I think we all have worked with and deeply respect, Carol Ward, has flipped the question uh, sort of on its head and has said that asking why humans stood up from all fours is the wrong question. Perhaps we should instead be asking why our ancestors never dropped down on all fours in the first place. Uh, and this was um, following the discovery of a pelvis uh, from uh, what's called Rudopithecus, uh, which is a fascinating Miocene ape um, uh, that, that looked like it was potentially uh, more uh, upright than say a chimpanzee or a gorilla, not saying it was bipedal, but certainly a little more upright. Now, in order to really get at these questions, right? Why did bipedalism evolve? When did it evolve? Where did it evolve? From what did it evolve? We need fossils. And the sad reality is that the key time periods from which we really need these fossils between six and say 10 million years ago, where we have bookended these skeletons from the Miocene and from the Pliocene, um, we have very, very, very few fossils. Um, and so uh, we're going to have more as we find more of these things. But for now, uh, we only have these tantalizing little bits, like a, a toe bone here from Ethiopia and a, and a femur here from Kenya and uh, a skull from the country of Chad. And so I'll talk a little bit about these and what they tell us, and then I'll, and then I'll finish up. Um, so the oldest fossil we have that we think is a hominin, or has at least been purported to be a hominin, is from the 7 million year old uh, uh, site in Chad, uh, the species uh, known as Sahelanthropus chadensis. This was discovered about 20 years ago in the deserts, uh, the Sahel Desert in, in Chad. Um, and it's a skull, but the position of the hole at the bottom would indicate, as long as it's been reconstructed correctly, would indicate that the head would have perched on top of a vertical spine and that this would have been at least an upright animal capable of bipedal locomotion. But we don't walk with our heads, right? So it'd be really nice if we had something from below the neck. And sure enough, there was a femur that was discovered uh, uh, 20 years ago, Sahelanthropus chadensis. And it's just now being analyzed and uh, being uh, uh, um, uh, sort of put out into the public of what uh, folks think. Uh, there is a preprint uh, from the journal Nature, uh, from Frank Guy and colleagues, and then there's a publication that came out last year in the Journal of Human Evolution. And they come to wildly different conclusions. And so in the preprint, the argument is that this is definitely a bipedal femur. In fact, not only is it bipedal, it's an obligate biped. This thing has to walk on two legs on the basis of the anatomy that we found. And then in the Journal of Human Evolution, a different team has analyzed this fossil uh, and has argued that this is not a biped at all and that the femur has characteristics more similar to a chimpanzee or to a gorilla. Um, we'll see as we, as we, uh, uh, as more folks have a chance to look at this fossil, hopefully that happens. Um, but it's going to be really important for more eyes to look at this fossil, more analysis on this fossil. But the thing that I sort of take from this is that when you get to the common ancestor between a human and a chimpanzee, you're going to find these anatomies that are mixtures of both. And so of course, we're going to get these mixed signals. Um, and wading through that interpreting what anatomies matter and which ones don't is sort of the million dollar question for our field right now. As we move forward, Forward in time, up to about 6 million years ago, there are fossils from Kenya, a species known as Auroran tugenensis, and there's a beautiful femur. Unfortunately, there's not the end of it. The knee part of this would have been more informative for knowing whether it was bipedal or not, in my opinion. But the top part of it has a lot of the hallmarks that you see in something adapted for moving on two legs. The attachment for hip musculature, for instance, farther from the hip joint that would have allowed it to have some leverage as it was balancing on one leg, moving around on two legs. And so I am convinced that that is a femur from something at least uh, capable of moving on two legs. Whether it actually did or not, we could have used the knee end of that femur to figure out hopefully more discoveries are coming. In Ethiopia, there's a 5 million year old toe bone from Artipithecus ramidus that has the, the, a tilt to the bone that is consistent with pushing off the foot. 
it'd be nice to have more than a toe bone. Uh, but this is, you know, you work with what you have. And that toe bone is signaling at least some form of bipedalism uh, at this time in our evolutionary history. Finally, we do have a partial skeleton discovered by, uh, first discovered by Johannes Haile Selassie, working with Tim White's team in Ethiopia, four and a half million year old uh, partial skeleton known as Arty from Artipithecus ramidus. And the shape of the reconstructed pelvis is consistent with something that can balance itself on a single leg while it's walking on two. And there are aspects of the foot that are also consistent with pushing off the outside of the foot during some propulsion of bipedal locomotion while still retaining a grasping big toe for climbing. There's another foot skeleton from this species from a site called Gona that's been published by Scott Simpson and his team. And it too has some of the anatomies that we think are consistent with at least some degree of bipedal locomotion at this time in our evolutionary history. Now, I'll also mention that there are these intriguing footprints from the site of Trachilos in Crete that are six and a half million years old. Um, I'm not sure what to make of these things yet, but I wanna mention that they exist uh, and, and, and they've been interpreted by some of our colleagues as being evidence of bipedal locomotion uh, in something moving on the island of Crete six and a half million years ago. We'll see as more work is done at this site and on these footprints. But what a lot of these uh, discoveries I think are raising for us, these are fossils both from the Miocene and some of the fossils that we find in the, in the Pliocene um, are raising for me a couple of questions. And these are kind of big questions that I'd love to hear what other folks think about this. Um, if you're a hominin, if you're on the human lineage, do you have to be a biped? Is that a necessary characteristic? Is that a defining characteristic of our lineage? Or, or is it possible that this is something that evolved later uh, after the split with the ancestors of chimpanzees? And, and we can also sort of flip that question in a different way and ask the question of does a biped have to be a hominin? That if we find evidence of bipedalism in some of these, these Miocene and Pliocene hominins uh, or hominids, I should say, does that necessarily mean they're on the human lineage or might there have been experimentation going on with forms of locomotion before the split uh, with, with, with hominin? So these are fun questions that I think, again, we don't have the answers to right now, but it'd be fun, these are fun questions to sort of grapple with uh, as we're discovering more fossils and trying to figure out where they fit uh, in this, this tangled evolutionary tree uh, that, that, that we are uh, learning more and more about, but still have many, many questions about. So thank you, Seth, for the invitation to talk about bipedal evolution. Uh, that's the early stage of it. And now I'm gonna slide things over to Professor Ellie McNutt, who's gonna talk about later uh, bipedal evolution. Great, thank you, Professor De Silva. That was a wonderful presentation. I hope everyone learned a lot of the people who are watching. And as you said, we're gonna hand things over to, to Professor Ellie McNutt, who's a currently an Associate Professor of Instruction at Ohio University Heritage College of Osteopathic Medicine. She got her PhD from Dartmouth College in Biological Anthropology in 2019. And focuses on comparative anatomy to try and understand the evolution evolution of human locomotion. And I will hand it over to her and let her begin her presentation. Thank you, Seth. I'm an assistant professor. It'd be pretty impressive to be an associate <laughs> from 2019. Oh, I'm sorry, I read that wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no, no worries. Okay, just a second. So thank you all for coming and listening to our symposium. I'm really excited to chat with you today. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit, kind of a short and sweet, about some of the earliest unequivocal evidence for bipedalism and sort of make a plug for the strength of our comparative anatomy as one of the big tools we use to help us understand and look at ooh, some of these um, interesting fossils. Give me just a second, because I think my thing's gone rogue. Um, sure that it doesn't advance on me when I didn't want it to. All right, so obviously bipedalism is one of the defining features of the hominin clade. So this is 
anyone kind of the species that are related to humans, our ancestors and our cousins and sort of things on our family tree. And as Dr. De Silva pointed out, it's one of the things that makes us really weird. It's a strange way of moving through the world. We really don't share with any of the other kind of living mammals today, kind of exceptions for being bipedal are things like kangaroos, but these are obviously bouncing around the world in a very different way than we do. So in 2016, we found another trackway. This is trackway S. It's made by two individuals walking upright, um, and they seem to be a little bit larger than the individuals that have made the trackway G, but most um, uh, scientists also attribute them to the same species as G, which is Australicus afarensis, and that is the same species as the really famous fossil Lucy. And our big question then is sort of how do we know who these early footprints belong to? How do we match these up? with that early hominin. And the easiest and best answer is if we find fossils whose anatomies are gonna correspond well to the morphologies that are preserved within those footprints. And so one of the important pieces of information here is that the site of Laetoli is home to the type specimen, that's the sort of reference specimen for Australicus afarensis. This is Laetoli hominin number four. And our fossil record for afarensis includes a lot of the anatomies of the foot, of the knee, and of the hip. And those are really important because they give us some of these big hallmarks of the sort of skeletal anatomy that highlight bipedalism. So these include having a bicondylar angle of the knee. That's the, the angle that essentially puts our knees underneath our hips and over the tops of our feet and helps align our body's center of mass that helps keep us upright without wasting lots of energy. This includes the shape of our hips, having lateral facing um, hips that are going to align the musculature that's on the outside of our hips, our abductor muscles that are going to help us balance when we're standing on one leg so that we're able to maintain that upright position. And we have their feet largely represented primarily from a site in Hadar, which is in Ethiopia, um, which has a lot of the same preserved morphologies that we're seeing in the Laetoli trackway G and S in terms of turning their feet into a nice propulsive lever. They're going to have their toes largely in line, so they don't have that grasping toe that was still preserved in things like Artipithecus ramidus. Um, and in a lot of ways, their feet look very modern human-like. So luckily, sometimes we'll have fossils, but I want to talk about kind of an example of what if there is no direct fossil for comparison, or what if we have a fossil, but we don't have um, a lot of information about it? How do we go about interpreting what we're finding? And so I'm going to use the example of one of the last bipedal trackways that was discovered at Laetoli. It's a little more unusual, and this is Laetoli trackway A. So this was originally discovered first before trackways G and S. It was found in 1977 by um, Peter Jones and Philip Leakey. It's a set of five bipedal prints that at the time were thought to by potentially be displaying cross-stepping. This is kind of model walking, if you think about it, where you sort of cross one foot completely in front of the other. And these were initially suggested to belong to a hominin by Dr. Mary Leakey, whose team um, did this work, but there are some discrepancies between the trackway A and the trackway G prints. These things included things like this very broad forefoot. You can see these are size matched Laetoli A to a Laetoli G print. They have a very short step length, and at least the initial description of, of the internal morphology done by Michael Day also seemed a little inconsistent with what we see in modern humans, though that turns out to have to be taken with a bit of a grain of salt because they were never fully excavated internally in the initial um, excavation during the 1970s. And so those conclusions have to um, be sort of considered with that grain of salt. And these differences then led a couple researchers, primarily Michael Day and Russ Tuttle, to come up to a different hypothesis about how to interpret these footprints. And when they were trying to think of who might have made these if it wasn't a hominin, one of the things suggested is a bear, an ursid. Um, so you've seen this picture before. This is Petals, the bear in New Jersey, walking upright. And you can see that when bears walk upright, they can do so. They can do so quite compellingly. He kind of looks a little like a person in a bear suit. And it wasn't a crazy ask. There are bears that lived in Africa. This is Agrotherium africanum. It's about a grizzly bear-sized animal that was found in eastern and southern Africa at similar timeframes to the site at Laetoli. And so this is 
not a bad answer for an unusual footprint that doesn't seem to match, at least at the time when it was discovered with the fossils that were present at the same area. So how do we go around understanding and interpreting what we're finding here? And one of the primary tools we use is to utilize comparative anatomy. So that is comparing things that are living today, because of course we don't have a time machine. We can't go back in time and figure out how fossils were moving and see them in action. So the, sometimes the best things we can do is use the models of living animals to help us interpret what we're seeing in the fossil record. And we can do that in a couple ways. We can collect behavioral data on extant animals. So in the example for Laetile A, it's to be like asking a question of how often do wild by, um, American black bears walk by Pili and to recreate the kind of circumstances that are necessary to make what you might see at a site like Laetile A. And it turns out that's actually really uncommon in wild black bears. They tend to do that less than 0.03% of the time where they would walk upright for four or more steps. The other things we can do is then look at the way that living animals move. We can check out their gait mechanics. What do their footprints look like? And try and interpret how those match up with what we see in the fossil record. And so we collect footprints. We can collect gait data um, of, in this case, things like bears and chimpanzees, as Dr. De Silva pointed out, we often look at chimps and the, our close living relatives in primates because they're sort of our best model. There isn't any other hominin alive. Does that make them always the right uh, model, as he pointed out? Maybe not, but they are sort of the options presented to us by what's available in our natural world. Um, so we sort of have to do what we can. And then, you know, look at humans as well and compare those to the Laetoli trackways to try and figure out what things are doing. And those comparisons can be really important. They can give us important details. So for example, in this case, it showed us that when you look within the foot, you compare the heel of the foot to the ball of the foot, things like Laetoli A is actually really similar to the other Laetoli prints and to what we see in humans. We can look at how big their toes are and do those match up more with a hominoid, an ape, or with an ursid. And that's important because different animals are anatomically not the same. So in hominoids, apes, including hominins like us, the first digit is quite large and the other digits tend to be smaller. Whereas in a bear, it's actually the fifth that is the largest digit and the other ones tend to be even smaller. So that's important. That tells you, do you have a cross-stepping animal or do you have a bear in those big prints are actually the outside toe, and it lets us match up what we see in those footprints. And it turns out in this case that the proportions are actually much more hominoid-like. They have a really big first and a tiny second one presented in Laetoli A. So that tells us there's cross-stepping there, and that's really important because it says something about the capacity of this organism to stand on one leg and actually cross one leg in front of the other. And sort of along with that, our Laetoli A has a really short um, stride width relative to its step length. So how, how far apart are their feet from one another relative to how far do they step? And it's really tiny compared to what we see in quadrupeds like bears or chimpanzees when they're asked to stand up and walk bipedally. And you can see it kind of hanging out very differently, whereas all the other Laetoli prints are hanging out pretty much within what we see in modern humans. And that stride width has important implications for how we understand its capacity for bipedalism and what's going on. Because in a quadruped, if you ask them to stand up and move bipedally, they don't have that anatomy in their hips and in their knees. It's going to help them maintain their balance. And so they end up with lots of medial lateral sway. They're going to toddle side to side. And that has consequences for what we see in their gait. So they end up having this high stride width relative to their step length. Whereas other hominins, they're going to have a low medial sway because they're able to balance using those mechanisms in the lower limb, ending up with a low stride width to their step length. And that pelvic stabilization, that ability to maintain that balance on a single leg, turns out to be a really key early adaptation to hominin bipedalism. And sort of one of the hallmarks that we can use to kind of identify it in our fossil record when looking at footprints. And so that narrow stride width of Laetoli A turns out to be really good evidence for either the valgus knee with that bicondylar angle and or the presence of that lateral pelvic stabilization mechanism. And having either one of those traits is really strong evidence then that Laetoli A is actually made by a hominin rather than something like an ursid that's walking upright. So kind of what's next? What do you do if your comparative anatomy now shows something is inconsistent with what you might expect or what's possible from a quadrupedal animal moving bipedally? So in this case, the next question is sort of what hominin may have made that trackway instead? Um, it's pretty 
easy to imagine, given that these are tiny prints, that maybe they just belong to a juvenile Australopithecus afarensis. We know that afarensis is at Laetoli and that the fossils are there. So that's not a bad guess. But we can actually look at how things grow, which is called ontogenetic uh, ontogenetics and see how they change over time. And it turns out that our Laetoli A prints aren't consistent with what you'd expect for something that's an afarensis. It's just a young afarensis. They're, they're even more unusual. So that doesn't seem to be a good answer. We can also look inside prints. We utilize a lot of technology now um, that's available, things like 3D scanning, photogrammetry, to be able to go out into the field and actually record and take interesting and, and kind of in-depth measurements um, about fossils and fossil prints and be able to take them back and do really um, interesting comparisons between them, especially different sites or across different times. So we look at the internal topography of our Laetoli prints and compare them to populations um, of humans or chimpanzees, which are sort of our best examples that are alive today that we can actually have stand up and walk and give us some kind of um, range of variation for a particular population. It turns out that the Laetoli G and S prints, those that are uh, attributed to afarensis, are distinct from humans, but they fall within the range of modern human variation. Whereas Laetoli A is distinct not only from humans and the other Laetoli prints, but it's as distinct from those as what we see in the chimpanzee. And that's really suggesting then that this um, set of footprints belongs to not only another hominin, but a hominin that's different from the hominin that made trackways G and S. So kind of the conclusion for this is that the site of Laetoli is a really special one in our fossil record. It's not only the site of our oldest unequivocal evidence of hominin bipedalism, because we can see the footprints and we know that they're there, but this recent work then showing that we also have a second hominin present who's um, likely with a distinct and possibly even a, a more primitive foot than when we see in Afarensis, makes this site also one of the oldest unequivocal places of the potential for two hominin species to coexist. The nature of our fossil record, we tend to find um, a, you know, a fossil site which may have a fossil from one hominin here and maybe 10,000 years later, because dates tend to be quite wide swaths um, as, because that's the sort of restrictions of what we have for our geological dating around these. Maybe then I have another hominin 10,000 years later. So maybe they coexisted at a place and maybe they didn't. But the way that footprints are created, they're on really short timescales. This is on the order of something like hours to days. So at Laetoli, the organism that stood up and watched, they could have looked across the landscape at A and seen the afarensis walking and making G, um, which presents this really strange temporally kind of local place that isn't really present anywhere earlier in our fossil record than what we see at Laetoli. And this is consistent with what we're seeing a lot in our Pliocene in our fossil record, that there are lots of taxonomic, that is to say there are lots of species showing up in the Pliocene in our hominin fossil record, and that we have different kinds of locomotor diversity. So this is exemplified by some recent fossils, for example, like the Bertelli foot um, from Ronzo Mille, that are also showing that there are multiple different ways of standing up and moving as a biped, sort of different experiments happening within our fossil record of how to do this. And there sort of wasn't guaranteed only one way or one right way to be a biped, just because there's only humans walking around today. So it's a really cool um, kind of presentation of that. So I wanna thank you all for listening. Um, and I think we're gonna pass this over to Dr. Throckmorton to talk more about sort of modern um, applications and how they can uh, be applied to the past. All right, and that was Dr. Ellie McNutt, and that was a wonderful presentation. I think it raises many more questions, which, as Dr. DeSilva pointed out, is one of the best things about paleoanthropology, as it always raises more work for researchers to do. Now we're going to introduce Dr. Zach Frockmorton, who is an associate professor at and meadow at so Associate Professor and Medical Human Anatomy Director at Colorado University School of Medicine at Colorado State University. He got his PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 2013, and he is interested in the anatomical variation of functional musculoskeletal anatomy. And we're going to pass it over to him, and he's going to give his presentation right now. Hey, thanks very much, Seth, and I appreciate uh both what Dr. De Silva and Dr. Mitnock have presented. Uh, I thought it was very interesting that Jerry 
really emphasized how little we actually know about bipedalism. And I have to say that one of the things, uh, you know, I've been learning from Jerry for over a decade now, but the gesticulation and the body language and enthusiasm that you're able to convey while you're sitting down is really quite striking. I guess I just need to practice it more because I'm really used to walking around a classroom and uh, keeping my legs moving and my blood pumping and sitting here is just kind of strange and a little bit weird for me. And I'm thinking maybe we just became bipedal because it accelerate blood flow throughout the body and keeps fresh blood cycling up through the head. And, uh, but I doubt that's it. And I am not entirely certain how we would even test that if that were the case. Uh, but with that said, um, as Seth mentioned, I am a uh, professor of anatomy or associate professor of anatomy and not anthropology. And so I spend a lot more time working with the, uh, humans and hominins that have been deceased on the scale of uh, days to weeks to months to years rather than tens of thousands of years or hundreds of thousands or millions of years. And so that has dominated the way that I approach my uh, thinking about the evolution of bipedalism. And as a result of uh, training more and more in neuroanatomy and embryology and histology, I've started to incorporate those anatomical sciences into how I think about bipedalism evolution. So I wanted to chat with uh, everybody today about how we can better understand human bipedalism and potentially its origins by looking at how uh, soft tissues uh, vary and function in uh, the recently living and the living uh, hominins. So generally speaking, soft tissues don't fossilize. And Dr. McNutt talked about the circumstances that re are required to produce fossils. And we usually don't get a great idea of how soft tissues might have appeared in past species. Uh, obviously, the Tong child is a glorious, beautiful example of the fossilization of soft tissues and hominins. But even then, we're getting a nice uh, cast of the brain, but we don't necessarily get to see some of the more uh, fine-grained details is certainly not like spinocerebellar tract anatomy that might have given us an idea about how uh, early australopithecines might have been able to walk uh, with some fluidity and fluency compared to, say, you know, clumsy-looking chimps and bears when they walk bipedally. We generally don't have the ability to connect genetic variation to many soft tissue variations, largely because of the tremendous variation in developmental anatomy. There are some, uh, I think this is you know, very cutting edge, uh, the connection between genetic variation to the uh, modulation of entire structures. Some recent work that's been done has been very cool, showing how our toes might have shortened and the net genetic mechanisms of that. Uh, but in the absence of fossils and largely in the absence of understanding genetic evolution and how it affects the variation and evolution of soft tissues, uh, we're left with what we have today. And most of what I'm talking about is coming from studies on uh, recently deceased living or modern humans. So uh, to jump right in with some functional comparative anatomy and comparative in the sense that we're going to compare our own hands to our own feet. Uh, one of the important series of muscles that are very similar in human hands and human feet are the interossei. You have two sets of them. One is more palmar or more plantar. Uh, the other is more dorsal uh, on both the hands and the feet. And I always teach my students the same mnemonic that I learned, pad dab, the plantar and the foot and the palmar interossei. Uh, AD duct, and they bring the digits toward the midline of the hand or the foot, and the dabs, the dorsal inner osseous AB duct, and so those are responsible for spreading or fanning the fingers away from the midline of the foot or the hand. And interestingly enough, uh, in humans, the manual dorsal inner osseous are aligned along digit three, which suggests that the central axis of the hand. Uh, or the upper extremity in the hand is the third digit, which makes sense because if you have five digits, number three is in the middle. Uh, whereas in the feet, the dorsal inner osseous are actually aligned along digit two. And so that is a difference between our feet versus our hands. And when we look at the palmar inner osseous, 
uh, of the hands, those are also aligned along digit three and in the feet, the plantar interosseae are also aligned along digit two. And so we have this interesting uh, contrast between human hands and human feet and that the interosseae of the hands are aligned along the third digit in the middle, whereas in the feet, they are aligned along the second digit which is not in the middle. I was never particularly great at math, but this much I understand. Two is not in the middle of the set, one through five. And when we look at other primates, the midline of the foot is the third digit, just like in the hand of other primates and in human hands. And so in this sense, it appears that humans are unique in the orientation of these small muscles, which are not particularly powerful. They don't leave giant marks on bones like some of the real powerful muscles do like maybe the biceps brachii which is an important uh mover of the shoulder and in the uh, elbow puts lots of marks on multiple different bones that are easy to pick up on fossils and in uh, skeletons from recently living humans uh, and so i think that this is uh, really good it gives us good insight into not just the fact that human bipedalism has necessitated changes in bones, but it has entailed changes in muscles as well. Uh, but like Jerry talked about at length, we don't have a great idea of what exactly our feet even evolved from in the first place. And so one of the things that I think is uh, very interesting when you go through and start looking at larger sample sizes of uh, not only humans, but other animals as well, we see that, in fact, every once in a while, the feet of chimpanzees, uh, whether they are common chimpanzees or bonobos and gorillas, every once in a while, they'll have their plantar uh, interosseae and their dorsal interosseae along, aligned along their second digit in their feet. And so it seems like this anatomical variation is standing, if you pardon the terrible pun, uh, in African apes, and that the potentially, you know, the common ancestor of chimps and humans, and maybe even including common ancestor with gorillas, already had this variation in how its plantar and dorsal interosseae uh, presented themselves at the population level, and humans have simply taken it to an extreme where, uh, I'm, you know, I, I always, you know, talk about with my students so that there's always an exception somewhere to human anatomy but in the case of the dorsal and plantar interosseae being aligned along digit two you know i've been looking at uh, hundreds of humans for a decade now and i've never seen them aligned along anything other than the second digit and so what you see is shifts towards uh shifts in means uh, way away in humans compared to what you see in uh chimpanzees and gorillas which uh, introductory evolutionary biology was 20 years ago for me now, but I seem to remember shifts in means and populations as being a key indication of evolution. We don't just see that in terms of muscles. We see that in terms of neuroanatomy as well. And this is from a really cool study that was done by Hashimoto and colleagues almost a decade ago uh, in which they used um, functional MRI imaging and uh, some other types of imaging, uh, electromyographs, uh, to determine that humans and Japanese macaque hands have independent regions for each digit uh, in their primary somatosensory cortex, uh, so their um, postcentral gyrus uh, in the parietal lobe of the cerebrum, and in Japanese macaques, the foot and the toes lack their own discrete region in the primary somatosensory cortex. And so Japanese macaques can't really isolate sensation, at least in the uh, S1, the primary somatosensory cortex. Whereas in humans, there are overlapping fields for the uh, digits two through five but there is a discrete field in digit one. In other words, there is a, a, its own entire region is dedicated in the brain in humans to being able to figure out what the big toe is sensing compared to the other toes. Uh, 
And one of the things that I thought was interesting about this paper is that there's also the amount of overlap between digit five versus digits three and four in humans is fairly minor. And so that there is not a discrete somatosensory cortex portion dedicated to the little toe. But it seems that it is uh, getting a little bit, uh, it, is, it is moving towards that way. If you uh, think of evolution as you know, what we're experiencing as a snapshot in time in the process. And so I think that uh, more detailed studies looking at what is the level of sensation along the little toe uh, is something that might be in, in very interesting in terms of not just being able to sense the medial column as distinct in humans, but also being able to sense the lateral column uh, in terms of how we understand the position of our feet in the world as we walk through it. And so more recent papers have looked at uh, the microanatomy of sensory neuroanatomy in human hands and in human feet. And this is a very recent paper from Jin and colleagues that was in uh, the Annals of Anatomy, the Anatomischer Anzeiger, uh, demonstrating that Piscinian corpuscles, which are now um, increasingly known as lamellar corpuscles, uh, those are mechanoreceptors that sense pressure changes and surface textures. It, with deep pressure, they're located a little bit deeper in the skin, and so they are more sensitive to uh, deeper, more powerful, more pressure touch. And in human hands, they tend to be concentrated more distally, and there are more of these lamellar corpuscles in the fifth finger than other digits, and that's very similar to the pattern that's found in monkeys and in monkey hands. Uh, but in human feet, they're concentrated in the distal metatarsals and in the ball of the foot, um, which I think is not the least bit surprising considering that the ball of the foot is going to be the last part of the foot that's going to be contacting the substrate during the normal walking cycle. And so when you go to pick your foot up off the ground, you are transitioning from uh, you know, having a better support to less support. You wanna make sure that you pick your foot off the ground in a way that is facilitating safe, uh, safely swinging your foot forward. Um, there's also a really high concentration of these lamellar corpuscles along the big toe. And the highest concentration of lamellar corpuscles apparently within the entire human body is along the, uh, the axis of the big toe uh, on that medial column, which should make sense because most humans tend to load the most amount of pressure underneath their first, their first digit along the medial column of their foot. Uh, and you, we, you know, we want to have a very good idea of exactly how that toe is contacting the ground as we walk. When we look at other types of mechanoreceptors, other types of sensory receptors in the feet, this is from a paper that came out about the same time as the previous one by, uh, you'll have to pardon my French, is awful, uh, Visu, I think it would be, um, from Neurophys Clinic. Uh, Demonstrating that the um, lamellar or Piscinian corpuscles, uh, while they're deeper and sensing deeper pressure, tend to be more well distributed along the medial column, although we have a lot on the balls of the feet as well. There are these other uh, mechanoreceptors, specifically these Meissner's corpuscles and these Merkel discs, they tend to be more concentrated along the lateral part of the foot. And so because humans tend to put more weight medially than laterally, uh, it seems to follow that we have these Meissner's and Merkel's receptors uh, sensing light pressure along the lateral column of our foot, the outside of our feet, just to be able to have better information about how our feet are positioned on the ground as we walk. And so this is something that I doubt we're ever going to be able to get out of the fossil record. I don't think we're ever going to have an idea about how uh, Piscinian Meissner's and Merkel's endings are going to be preserved along the soles of the feet of our ancient Australopithecine ancestors. Uh, but this is absolutely something that we can get better ideas and better understanding about in terms of comparative anatomy if we were to look at the microanatomy of some of our closest living relatives. And so I, when I, you know, Dr. De Silva was talking about what are the next steps? What is there to learn?
Um, you could see these detailed studies of microanatomy in humans are only within the last couple of years, and we can start to look at what the uh, patterns are in other animals of interest that are often used in terms of um, comparative and evolutionary anatomy studies as we move through time, um, or as we move across species, excuse me, I was a Freudian slip thinking about evolution through time, but even though I'm talking about comparative anatomy. And uh, this is a slide that I just threw in while uh, we were talking. Dr. De Silva brought up the fact that walking on two legs has downsides. Uh, and one of the things that Dr. McNutt emphasized this strange and unusual and weird about human bipedalism is that we are able to do it with our feet really close to each other. And I think one of the things that I... Uh, is fascinating to me is that it seems that modern humans are really good at bipedalism. And so we know from studies on fossils that there were lots of different ways to be a biped in the past. Um, but it seems like most modern humans today are really quite good at it. And there are a whole class of disorders, gait disturbances that change how people walk based on different problems that they have with their bodies. And so one of the diagnostic form or a um, gait disturbance that has a really uh, characteristic uh, presentation to it is cerebellar or ataxic gait. And so the cerebellum in humans and other mammals is not directly involved uh, with the um, voluntary motor movements. Like you don't think with your cerebellum, I want to put my right foot forward or I want to jump off my left foot or I want to pick up the pencil and write with my right hand. But the cerebellum in humans, at least, is very important in the uh, modulation and the fine detailed coordination of different types of movements, including walking. And so when you get lesions of the cerebellum due to like a stroke or whatever, uh, one of the first compensatory mechanisms that these folks will start doing is that they will spread their feet apart so that they have a wider base so that they're less likely to fall over. And um, I've only ever read about uh, the fact that you know, ethanol intoxication can also interfere with cerebellar function, which is why one of the first things that people do when they walk when they are intoxicated on ethanol as they start to put their um, feet further apart, they get this wide base tottering, uh, showing the susceptibility of human walking to uh, different types of injuries, whether those are self-inflicted or otherwise. Uh, and so I think that, uh, you know, continued studies on not only how does human gait function properly, but how does human gait function improperly might give us an idea about how hominins might have moved in the past because, you know, uh, I've, I've had this similar conversation that Jerry did with our colleague, Will Harcourt-Smith. You know, the, well, the benefits had to have outweighed the downsides. Well, we were looking at probably five, six million years of bipedal evolution. We should reasonably expect we're better at it today than we were our ancestors were five, six million years ago. And mitigating the chances that you fall over and hurt yourself. Uh, it seems like one way to make uh, bipedalism that much better. And so a lot of energy is focused on, you know, how uh, bipedalism changes energetics. Are we more efficient? Uh, but I think one of the things that we can start to consider more and more uh, as we move forward, our studies on how bipedalism evolved was how did walking, how did it get safer? Uh, I always joke with colleagues that, don't matter whether you're as fast as Usain Bolt or as slow as I am, you're toast on ancient African savannas. The lion's going to get you. And that if you're running away, you've already lost as a human. But there's a major difference between a human who is walking normal and healthy and a human that's blown out their ankle. And so if a human has uh, suffered a severe eversion sprain and has started the deltoid ligament, they're in serious trouble. And um, not just in terms of energetics, but in terms of their safety. Uh, so that's one of the things that I like to think about when uh, I consider how did bipedalism evolve, not just uh, bones and energetics, uh, but looking at soft tissues and things like joint safety. You know, one of the things that we've demonstrated with some of the recent research on um, 
the Homo naledi is that their ankles are very similar to us in a very limited range of motion. And anytime you see a joint with a very limited range of motion, you can infer that it's a lot stronger because all joints are a trade-off between stability and flexibility. And so I think that it's interesting that you see ancient hominins that uh, might have walked in ways not so similar to us seem to have stabilized some of the joints of their lower limb uh, with more urgency, like the ankle, than others, like hips. Um, so in summary, uh, yep, uh, we're looking at pedial cutaneous microanatomy is giving us insights into um, bipedalism, which is something that I don't think a lot of folks have done a lot of in the past. Um, you know, we, we can, maybe with better methods and better refinements, I want to make the comment that these inner osseae might not leave the biggest marks on bones, well, that's the visual inspection with the naked eye. Better 3D laser scanning techniques, we might be able to pick up these types of changes even with these teeny tiny intrinsic muscles of the feet. Um, and then certainly, uh, you know, better understanding of how our brains perceive the world we walk on. Probably never going to get fossil disease. It's really difficult to do these types of comparative studies on other animals because they are fairly invasive and of dubious ethics. Uh, but we can understand how these, uh, how when it goes wrong in a living human, what kind of insight that might give to the evolutions of bipedalism too. So thank you very much for listening to my chat. All right, and thank you, Dr. Throckmorton. That was a very interesting and anatomically detailed discussion. I think a lot of people, like you said, don't look at it from that approach. And I think that'll hopefully give a lot of people something to think about. Now, before we go to our question and answer session, I do want to introduce another one of our guests. And that would be Dr. Ashley Hammond, who will be part of our discussion team today. She is an associate curator and associate professor at the American Museum of Natural History. She works on the fossil evidence for ape and human evolution with a particular interest in what was happening during the latest Miocene period. And most of her field work takes place in Kenya in collaboration with researchers at the National Museums of Kenya. Unfortunately, she did injure her arm and is not able to make a presentation for us today, but she will be participating in our discussion. And I wanted to hand it over to her before the Q&A if there was anything she wanted to add before we get to questions. So I'll hand it over to you. I guess I could just add that some of the points raised by Jerry and Zach about dangers of bipedalism, I... I totally see things differently this week than I do last week um, because I injured myself just walking. So um, thanks everyone. I have to say this was a super fun um, set of talks to listen to. And in some ways I'm really glad that I've been pulled out as a discussant rather than a presenter because especially with, with Jerry's presentation, I think we would have had so many overlap, so much overlap in our perspectives and interpretations that this makes it more fun now. Um, the audience doesn't have to hear the same thing twice, basically. Um, so I'm happy to hand it back to, to Seth to get things started with the Q&A. All right. And so we will. Let me just pull up the questions real quick. We don't have too many of them. Again, for anyone who is listening, these questions are gathered before we do the recordings for the entire time since I posted and you can just email the questions to world of paleoanthropology at gmail.com and we will go through them on our presentations but you have to get them in on time or unfortunately we can't ask them. So first question for whoever wants to answer this one was Hamid of course, I, I did, I'll state that I did not go through these questions and correct them in any way. So if there are little mistakes, that's how they were written. Was hominid bipedalism driven by a necessity for competition from other ape species like gorillas and chimpanzees or the same environmental niches, which necess necessitated the move out of forested areas, forested areas instead of changing climatic conditions, causing more open woodland environments? 
Anyone want to take that one? <laughs> sure, I'll answer that. I don't know. <laughs> you know, I think Jerry kind of touched on this a bit when he was introducing the scenarios for why bipedalism evolved. And the fact of the matter is we don't know yet where or when exactly hominin bipedalism evolved and from what kind of animal it evolved from so or evolved in. So, you know, we don't know if the ancestor was doing things in a, a niche like chimps or gorillas or looked like a chimp or a gorilla or if it evolved somewhere else entirely and didn't look like a chimp. So, you know, as Jerry said, this is still a big question mark. We just don't know. And what I'd I, add to that, Ashley, is um, I'd love to know what an ancient chimp or gorilla looked like, right? Um, like, what does a five million year old gorilla look like? We need we need a Lucy for chimps and for gorillas um, because we use the modern animals as our substitute for what they may have looked like, and that that could be maybe it's right, maybe it's right, maybe they haven't changed much in five million years, but I six, seven million years, but I, I doubt it. I think they probably, you know, are, are different. How different remains to be seen. Um, so what niche they were filling five, six, seven, eight, nine million years ago, I think is still an open question um, and a really fun one. And like, like a top five of my wish list of future fossils is, you know, a, f a fossil chimp, right? From, from, the time period that, that you work in. Do you want to quickly go over why it's a little off topic, but why we don't have those fossils? We don't have ancient ape fossils. Because those are going to make the cover of National Geographic and more funding. So when it's ambiguous, <laughs> we call it an ancient human because that'll be splashier and get more money than if we call it an ancient shell. Some of it's also the same kinds of things about the kind of like, did an animal die? And then is it in a place that you can make a fossil? So it's, forests tend to be more acidic environments. So if an animal dies in a forested environment, you may not get that that remains to survive that process and become a fossil. So you oftentimes the ones that you know, kind of come to mind that were in forested environments, may have ended up in a cave. So you end up getting into an environment that will allow that to be preserved. And if you don't do that it doesn't mean those animals weren't there and that they're not existing it just means we may not necessarily have preservation of of their their fossils and be able to kind of find those so you have to get the right circumstances to locate those animals um, which can be troublesome nature of our fossil record most definitely and looking Actually, for this I'm question curious how Ash sorry i'm curious how ashley would answer that question too um <laughs> of why because I, I have some additional thoughts from what's been said, and I agree with what's been said so far, but I'm, I mean, you work so in I, this time period, so I'm wondering I think what a think. big part of it is just the, the location and that fossils that are, you know, potential fossils, animals that die in forest environments are unlikely to preserve and become fossils. So I think that's a huge part of it. Um, I do think that there are parts of Africa that are, underexplored and that's for a variety of reasons it's a lot of it's just logistical or a challenging place to work um, but there are spots here and there throughout Africa where there are um, sediments from the key time periods that are preserved but we need to get more people more paleoanthropologists on the ground working even if it's an unrewarding site really trying to find new fossils from that time period. Because it seems like that the absence of that, like if you can collect enough and know that, okay, chimp ancestors or hominins or whatever, apes weren't here, then we can start to say, okay, these are the kinds of environments at 5 million, 6 million, 7 million where hominins or, or, or whatever hominid, if you want to you know, expand it to chimps and gorillas too, that they weren't there, right? So if they weren't there, then they must have been, or they could have I been. Here I instead, totally agree right? with you. I think it is so important to be able to rule out which kind of environments were unappealing to early hominins or even, you know, um, African apes during the, the same time period. But I think Zach kind of hit this on the head with it's very hard to get funding for sites that do not produce 
some initial evidence for fossil apes or fossil humans. So even though we all understand that it's very important to document those sites and thoroughly understand them and why hominins weren't living in them, it's also a practical issue of getting funding. All right, and this next question is kind of a combo question. I'm putting a few together. What systems were affected with the transition to a more bipedal posture, such as the digestive system, the birthing process? How did these things change when we became upright? Well, anyone wants to Ashley, you want to take on reproduction and birthing? Well, I, I have a more fundamental question is, is, you know, when did we become upright? Um, mm. So as Jerry pointed out, a lot of the primates use upright behaviors quite a lot of the time. And certainly, you know, I, I think we would all agree that the body plan of gibbons, chimps, gorillas, it's all based on orthograde or sort of upright forms of locomotion, not necessarily bipedalism, but for doing things with an upright trunk. So some of the changes that we might be talking about could have happened very early on. So yeah. maybe changes to the digestive tract would have happened quite early on in ape evolution, whereas uh, changes associated with the birth canal or birthing process, that might be much later. Um, but I'm, I'm curious to hear what others think about this. You might get it changing twice too, sort of at orthograde. And then as you become bipedal, especially if you become a very good biped, there's some discussions about whether bipedalism opened up the opportunity to either hunt or scavenge, scavenge meat more and things. So you're sort of changing opportunities of what you're eating as well, which would then have effects on, on the digestive system, for example. So sort of it's, it's not a one and done kind of change as well. As you change your posture, it, it has effects throughout, especially as you sort of improve or change your environment that you're utilizing because of the way that you move. Yeah, and I'd, I'd add to that that there might have been, <laughs> I'd add another stage in there where you've got the, you know, orthograde or this uprightness that we see that the apes all share in common. And I mean, this goes back a hundred years, right? To Sir Arthur Keith's observations that the pelvic floor of the apes is all, it's all really, really, really similar. These tailless animals are supporting their, their you know internal reproductive and dige digestive organs with the pelvic floor um structured in such a similar way i i have a i have a really hard time accepting that that's that that evolved multiple times um i think that the the ape common ancestor was probably an orthograde animal how suspensory it was i think is, is another question that we can argue about um but i think uprightness and orthograde is something that probably goes back pretty far um and 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 then right then from there you've got your early bipeds like Artipithecus, but with that foot and that hand and I it, that that thing is really dependent on the trees and so we've got this this stage and this is the stage of human evolution that I struggle with the most is this sort sort of you know five six seven million year time period where your at least the the fossils we have which are not many but the ones we do have seem to imply that you've got this this a boreally adapted animal up in the trees eating in the trees and then and then it supposedly is moving on the ground when it's trying to get from food patch to food patch but you look at that foot from artipithecus um, and other aspects of its anatomy and it's not a good biped right <laughs> if we think about you know the things you need to be a biped um it's kind of a crappy biped so how given that i think bipedalism uh, disadvantages us in so many other ways when you're good at it, even when you're good at it, right? You still fall and you still, you're still slow. Um, how can you get away with being a lousy biped? And so that's what I'm really struggling with is that and it seems to be this real big chunk of time where this niche is being filled by this artipithecus like thing, unless, unless that is not part of the story. And there's, there's something else we haven't found yet. That's part of the story. Um, that's the time period that I think I'm really struggling with of how does that animal survive? What is the environment in which that's a good idea? Um, and you're not going to just get eaten I agree. Um, when you I come agree. down to the ground. I agree with Jerry. When I look at humans, I think this is uh, maybe not the safest way to move around, but I get it. There's some major pros to this. When I look at chimpanzees and gorillas, I also think there's some drawbacks, but 
I can see how this makes sense too, but I look at those fossils, you know, again, like you were saying, Jerry, five, six million years ago. And I think was your primary anti-predator device like awkwardness and you just confuse them and they're like, what are you? I think I should just keep going because you don't match a prey signature the way that you move. Um, but one of the things that I think is uh, particularly interesting about bipedalism and how it relates to both the GI tract and uh, the pulm pulmonary system is that uh, one of the things I never really appreciated until I had the opportunity to dissect some larger mammals that move around typically of mammals like Jerry was talking about, you know, dissecting cows, dissecting horses, uh, pigs, goats, whatever, is how absolutely enormous their GI tracts are, how massive they are, and how whenever they are moving at high speed, their breathing is constrained by the mass of their GI tract swinging forward when the front legs hit the ground and hitting their diaphragm. And so uh, terrestrial mammals all have the basic setup of you got your thorax, which has some lungs and a heart in it, and you got your abdomen, which has got your GI, uh, your viscera, and your guts. And in humans, because of our completely bipedal locomotion, and I don't know if this is uh, – reduced in apes, uh, you know, chimpanzees and gorillas is something I got to look more into. But in humans, at least the way that we move um, decouples our breathing yeah. regulation from how we move. And so, uh, you know, when I first moved out here to Colorado about a year ago, one of the things that I'm immediately struck by, man, I was, I walked up two flights of stairs and I'm already winded. Well, that's because I'm at 5,000 feet of elevation, which is harder to breathe in. And uh, as I've gotten more acclimated to uh, living at higher altitude, you know, uh, get better appreciation for the fact that you can increase your breathing rate independent of how quickly you're moving. So I can walk across campus at my usual slow pace and still breathe fairly rapidly. Um, I've always wondered how that relates not just to energetics, but also to speaking. And when I think about things that are really important for humans. I think about how we are able to use our hands with great dexterity and how we're able to speak. And bipedalism very conveniently freed up our hands to do whatever we need to do with them and freed up our ability to communicate really well while we're moving at a steady clip. And so one of the things that um, you know, my wife and I love to do is we love to go hiking in Rocky Mountain National Park, some of the state parks in southern Wyoming. You know, simply being able to continually communicate, use my hands while I'm traversing the ground uh, is something that is pretty unique amongst mammals. Mammals have uh, constrained abilities to communicate when they are moving. And they have constrained abilities to use their forelimbs when they're using, when they're moving around. And um, I hate to say that, uh, you know, bipedalism was forced by greater importance of other systems, but I mean, it is the pedestal. So if it holds everything else up, I guess that's okay too. Yeah, I, I like that, Zach. Um, so one of the things I've sort of struggled with and thought about a little bit um, is this this, right, well, you said the relationship between bipedalism and, and speech um, and the decoupling of breathing and our locomotion. Um, it seems to me, and maybe I'm way off here, but it seems to me that the, that the other animals that are really, really good at communication, um, birds, right, our songbirds, um, are, are bipeds. Um, and and their, 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 you know, musculoskeletal system and their physiology is very different from ours. Um, but there is one thing they share in common. And then behind Ashley is the other really great communicator, right? Um, and, and the buoyancy, it's the buoyancy, right? That is preventing uh, or going to be limiting, you know, digestive system slamming up against the diaphragm. Um, and uh, amongst primates, one of the best communicators is the gelata. And gelata is, um, will sit and feed. So they're very upright and they sit and feed. Uh, and again, they're not doing it while they're traveling. They're sitting and, and, and chatting with each other with their little chirps and gerbils. Um, and so I, I do think there's something to that. Um, and look, I'd argue that bipedalism set in motion all of these systems that we're talking about, reproductive, digestive, um, and, and even in this case, you know, respiratory and, 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 and vocal.
Yeah, talk about decoupling locomotion from uh, vocalization. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd say the cetacean is a pretty good example of that, too. <laughs> now, for our next question, I'm not sure exactly what this is, so maybe one of you can explain it to me as well. The question is, how does Lovejoy's provisioning hypothesis hold up? when it comes to today's sciences. I'm happy to explain it. And then if someone else wants to then do something with it. <laughs> so uh, uh, in 1981, Owen Lovejoy proposed what's called the provisioning hypothesis, the idea um, that bipedalism arose um, uh, in early hominins uh, in coordination with reduced canines. Uh, and the idea is that the males are not competing with each other anymore. Instead, with their freed hands, because they're bipedal, they were gathering food and then uh, sharing food with females. Those females would then find those males uh, attractive uh, because they were provisioning the females and then would mate with those males. And any males that had big canines and were fighting with each other uh, would lose out on potential mating opportunities. Um, and my, you know, my, real quick, my problem with it is that it really centers males, um, and it doesn't involve females much uh, in, in in terms of the driving force of of early evolutionary processes in our in hominins, um, which is something that Tanner and Zillman a decade earlier were doing and were framing it around around food sharing as well. Um, but others should jump in and make corrections to my characterization of that and what they think of it. So I like the Lovejoy hypothesis in that it, it connects several different aspects of sort of unusual aspects of early hominins into a single hypothesis. So the, the, the reduction in canines and, um, you know, maybe some changes in um, sexual and reproductive behavior and, and bipedality all in, in one hypothesis. Um, I I agree with Jerry that it really focuses on the males in a way that I struggle with. Um, and I, I also struggle with it in sort of, um, you know, thinking about early hominins and how vulnerable they would be um, if they were in sort of these smaller groups, basically pair bonded individuals. And maybe that's not what what Lovejoy was implying there that these were basically just monogamous pairs on the landscape. But I think early hominins seem like they would have been pretty vulnerable and still needed to have been in pretty large groups and large groups are, I think, less compatible with a monogamous social structure. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Ashley. It's again, it's uh, along those same lines. If you think about what makes humans safe today in the, you know, the cruel world that is nature red and tooth and claw, it is safety in numbers and tool use. There's nothing on this planet that poses a serious challenge to two dozen humans that are equipped with spears. Except another group of humans that's got three dozen and they got better spears, but that's a different. But that's a different. Uh, that's a different scenario. I agree as well. Yeah. So what I like about the idea, though, is that it, it's one of the few hypotheses about hominin origins that I think is testable with the fossil record. Um, and so one of the things that you would predict is that you never would find fossils of things that were bipedal but had really dimorphic canines like that shouldn't ever pop up um if lovejoy is right um and so as we find more fossils you know but the big challenge is going to be if you find a biped but it's got dimorphic canines is it a hominin that's going to be the big the big argument that ensues right um but but it, but it does lay out certain predictions about what we should see in the fossil record. Uh, dimorphism should be reduced, for instance. And oh. so when Artipithecus was announced and it had, according to the team that found it, low dimorphism, they argued that was support for the provisioning idea. Um, so what we'll, we'll see as we find, you know, what is a, you know, what does the second Sahelanthropus look like, right? Um, what does another Auroran look like? Is there so a lot of dimorphism? I think that's a really critical point too, is that when the the provisioning hypothesis was put forward in 1981, 
most of what we knew about early hominin evolution was based on Lucy species, yeah. Australopithecus afarensis. And, you know, at this point, now we actually, we recognize that Lucy species is not even a very early hominin. She's, that species is actually about halfway through hominin evolution. So, and the early, the earlier half is very poorly represented in the fossil record. So, and her species, not, sorry, Ashley, and her species was a pretty good biped. Yeah, Which but you would expect that for halfway through, right? Yeah, I'd expect that, yeah. So I think really fleshing out the early earliest time periods is going to be critical to testing out the different scenarios. I think that one thing that we do potentially to our own detriment is uh, I, I still think that a lot of our thinking and discussions are dominated by adaptive hypotheses. And if we assume that the common ancestor of the three lineages of African apes had this, it almost doesn't matter how it got around. Is it too surprising that from random processes alone, you'd get one lineage doing one thing and two lineages doing something else? I mean, you only got three opportunities. And we also know that chimpanzee and gorilla knuckle walking is actually fairly different, especially in terms of the ontogeny of some of their uh, extremities. Um, I don't know. I think that you know, it's, again, we think about bipedalism in terms of its uh, selective advantages and maybe not in terms enough of, you know, it's good enough. It works. It's seemingly worked well enough. And once we started down that road, we got better and better at it. But even still, you know, look at the joints of the lower limb and the lower back. I mean, our knees are terrible. Our ankles work great, but our knees are off. And so, um, you know, do we need an adaptive explanation for why bipedalism at all? Nice. It's not a very compelling story. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not taking that bait. Yeah, um, no. <laughs> <laughs> I think with that, that would be a wonderful place for us to conclude our wonderful little symposium here. I just want to thank all of you for coming on. It was truly a wonderful time. And I really appreciate the time and dedication that the four of you put towards this. And I just want to say thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank My you, pleasure. Seth. Thanks, Seth. All right, I'll stop recording. Hello everyone. Thank you for watching this episode of The Story of Us. I hope you had an amazing time and learning experience. My guests and I had a great time putting this together for your enjoyment. I hope that you learned something and that there's always more to learn. If you would like to watch our previous episodes, please view them on my YouTube channel or my website, which is listed in the description below. And please subscribe and like to not miss future episodes. Thank you all so much and have a great rest of your day.